Section 14 of the Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Part 5 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Purchasing and Transportation The necessity of purchasing material in food and clothing was imperative even at the outset, notwithstanding the large contributions of both that were made from abroad but large as they were, they were not sufficient, even when most bountiful, to supply the demands made upon the committee, and only enabled them to bridge over the interval until supply and demand could be made to balance each other by an organized system. A purchasing committee, J. McGregor Adams, chairman, was therefore appointed, with experienced and responsible merchants to aid him, who, anticipating the wants at the several distributing points, hold themselves in readiness at all times, as far as possible, to meet the requisitions of the general superintendent. Their operations extend to all parts of this country and of England, for to replace even partially only the complete destruction of so much household stuff, the accumulation of years, and to feed so large a multitude suddenly deprived of their ordinary means of livelihood, is an immense and most difficult work. The supply of many manufactured articles in the markets immediately accessible to the committee, intended to meet the ordinary demand, has not been found to be at all commensurate to this sudden necessity to duplicate past supplies which had gone into the hands of the consumers. Chicago has wanted, for the past six weeks, more stoves of a certain pattern, more blankets, more mattresses, more boots and shoes, more furniture of various kinds, than were within its reach to meet the emergency. The problem has been to find and to purchase all these wherever they were, to contract for the manufacture of more as speedily as possible, and to get them into the hands of those in want. This onerous duty has devolved upon the purchasing committee, and it has required their utmost activity, assisted by a large clerical force, and a most thorough organization, to keep pace with the constant and pressing demands of an impoverished people. The weekly payroll given above shows the heavy expenditures for transportation, which must be constantly incurred. This also is under the direction of a special committee, of which Colonel Charles G. Hammond was appointed chairman. For several weeks their labors were much increased by the perplexing duty of providing passes for the large number of persons who wished to leave Chicago, and were without the means of doing so. It was absolutely necessary, though by no means easy, to discriminate among the multitude who asked for passes, as there was danger of giving to undeserving persons and imposing upon the generosity and good nature of the railroad companies, who had thrown open their roads as a part of the general relief. The number of free passes given was six thousand and thirty-five, Recommendations, which were usually accepted by the roads, for 297 were granted, and half fare was paid on 82 tickets. It is only now in exceptional cases that applications of this sort receive any favorable attention, and this branch of relief is pretty much closed. A careful record of names of persons and destinations has been kept and is an interesting voucher of one of the incidents of the great fire. To expedite the business of this committee, and indeed the business generally of the society, telegraphic communication has been established between headquarters and all the warehouses and stations. The convenience has been very great, as the distances between the points of communication are long, and the travel through the burnt portions of the city is much impeded while the expense is small, as the operators are also employed as clerks. For this facility, as well as for much else, the Society is indebted to the effective aid of General Stager, Superintendent of the Western Union Company. Storing and Receiving Goods In a preliminary report of this sort, it is not intended to enter upon detailed accounts of stock and accounts current. These more properly belong to an advanced stage of the work, when, after system and order are thoroughly established, there will be leisure to unravel some of the confusion and disorder 
which at the outset were inevitable. That this should be most marked and most difficult to deal with in the receiving and storing of goods was unavoidable. The principal railroad depots were destroyed by the fire, and the three hundred and thirty carloads of goods of all kinds, which from the eleventh to the sixteenth of October were so lavishly poured in from all parts of the country, and which, coming free of freight charges, were without waybills or invoices, had necessarily to be unloaded from side tracks at remote points of the town, the packages instantly opened and their contents disposed of, or sent without record or count wherever they were most needed. It was a question then only of feeding the starving and clothing the naked, and not of regularity of business. The law of humanity was paramount to the rules of commerce. General Sheridan had early taken possession of two large warehouses, and these, with full complement of workmen and guards, he presently turned over to a committee, Murray Nelson, chairman, to be assisted by General Hardy. This was the first step out of confusion in this department. About the same time, the skating rink on the west side, two large stores, a smaller one, and the Church of the Messiah, were taken and occupied, partly as storehouses and partly as points of distribution. They were no more than were needed then, for disorder demands space. But order gradually evolved out of this chaos, as the heterogeneous mass of contributions gave way to regular, though larger, commercial orders. The railroad arrangements were brought back to something of their former facilities, regular and numerous points of distribution were established, and system generally introduced and maintained. In accordance with the principle of concentration adopted in all the departments of the work, the general warehouses are now reduced to two only, the rink and the Church of the Messiah, the latter for its special bureau, while the former is the depot for all the articles except vegetables distributed in the various districts, and which are drawn from it by the special requisition of the superintendents as they are needed. A large frost-proof building has been built for the storage of vegetables, and two large cellars are used for the same purpose. These several warehouses may be said to constitute the wholesale department of the relief work, as the distributing districts are the retail establishments. The aim is to manage all with commercial exactness and economy, and notwithstanding the immense difficulties in the way, a reasonable degree of success has already been achieved. Employment Bureau There has been no lack of employment, particularly of unskilled labor, since the fire, but as that could not be foreseen, it was thought prudent to establish an employment bureau in connection with the general work. An employment committee, N. K. Fairbank, chairman, was therefore appointed, with headquarters in a temporary building in the courthouse yard. This has been a sort of labor exchange in the very heart of the burnt district, where those wanting mechanics or laborers could find them, and where those in need of work were provided with it. The superintendents at all the points of distribution are instructed to send every able-bodied man or boy who applies to them for aid to the Bureau of the Employment Committee, and the ticket he takes becomes a certificate of character. If labor is found for him, as is almost invariably the case, he surrenders the ticket, and it is returned to the superintendent who issued it. If the ticket is not presented at the employment bureau, and not returned, therefore, to the superintendent, it is presumptive evidence that the bearer prefers to eat the bread of idleness rather than work for his own subsistence, and if he again presents himself at the distributing station, his claim for relief is rejected. If, having obtained work, of which the returned ticket is evidence, he asks again for relief, the proper inquiry decides whether his labor is not sufficient to sustain himself and his family, if he has one, or whether he has asked for bounty of which he is not in need. This check upon imposition has served its purpose admirably, though it is no more than common justice to say that to shirk work and live upon charity by preference is the exception and not the rule among the laboring people of Chicago. 
most of the mechanics who apply at the employment bureau for work are in want of tools, without which they can do nothing at their trades. This want the committee has supplied, and by giving the applicant from ten to twenty dollars worth of tools, he is at once made self-supporting, and ceases to be dependent upon the Relief Society. A large number of carpenters have thus been effectively and permanently helped, as the demand for their labor is greater than for that of any other class. Bricklayers, gas fitters, shoemakers, and other mechanics have also been aided in the same way. The Bureau has not undertaken to find employment for women, but has turned that class over to other organizations who have hitherto made its care their special business. Excepting seamstresses, who are received and cared for by the Bureau of Special Relief, women seeking employment have been left under the direction of such societies, and especially of the Ladies' Christian Union, which in this part of the work has been a valuable coadjutor of the Relief and Aid Society. End of section 14